Thank you for listening to this resource provided by Westwood Baptist Church. Listen as Pastor Steve Smart brings a message of hope in Jesus Christ. You have your Bibles, and I hope you do. Take those out together and turn to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. Our text this morning begins in verse 13. And uh, if you're a guest with us this morning, we are glad you're here. As Shane said earlier, uh, please let us know you're here. We want to send you a bill for your tithes. And uh, make sure, no, no, we're not going to do that. But we would like to know you're here. I promise you won't get on a mailing list unless you choose to do so. We just want to make sure that we're able to be available to you, know that you're here, and uh, know if there's anything we can ever do to be a blessing to you. We certainly want to do that, whether it's through prayer or any other act of mercy or kindness that we can show. Uh, at the end of our service, we're going to conclude this morning with uh, the Lord's Supper. And uh, that's an occasion that we as a church do on a regular basis, uh, where we remember, as Christ commanded us to do, that which he has done for us on the cross, that uh, he suffered for us, uh, maintaining a perfect life so that he would be a perfect sacrifice in our place. Uh, And we take bread. We take bread, and uh, Jesus said, take that bread. Every time you take that bread, I want you to remember uh, that I maintained purity for you. I want you to remain, remember that I suffered for you. And then we take the cup. The cup uh, reminds us that Christ died for us. He didn't just suffer. He went all the way to the end, and he died in our place on the cross, and that his death was a perfect atoning sacrifice uh, for our sin. And so we take that cup to remind us that that's what Jesus did for us. We have a, a proclivity toward forgetting, don't we? Uh, it's easy for us to, uh, to remember things you know, what, that are immediate on our minds. But then as time goes on, life happens, we begin to forget things or things that get it's pushed back. And so we take the Lord's Supper. Jesus said for us to take the Lord's Supper so that we'll never forget what it is that he's done for us. So that we'll never get distracted away from that message that Christ has given us to proclaim that there's life in him. And uh, that all men from every nation, every man, woman, boy, and girl can know what it means to have life eternal through Jesus Christ, uh, God's Son. So, at the close of the service, if you're a guest with us this morning, then we invite you, and you know Christ as your Savior, then we invite you to come with us to the table, uh, take those elements, and let's worship together. If you're not a believer, if you wouldn't say, yeah, I'm a, I'm a Christian, then uh, here's what we'd ask, say, just watch. Uh, just observe. Just you know, don't don't be embarrassed to let that pa- that plate pass by, and uh, and allow, let us testify our faith to you, uh, the importance of what it is that Christ has done for us and what that means for us. Well, and as we look at our text this morning, Acts chapter four, beginning in verse thirteen, with very few exceptions, most of us here today have never had to deal with uh, religious persecution, uh, at least not to the extent that our lives were threatened or that we or our families were held against our will because of our confession, or even worse, harmed under threat of death. Now, there are a few of us who have experienced a taste of it at varying levels of severity. But for the most of us, we've never been forced into a situation where we had to choose between our faith and our freedom. Most of us have no idea what it's like to be arrested because we were telling people about Jesus Christ. 
Most of us have never received a judicial order demanding the silence of our Christian witness or an injunction that we no longer even speak the name of Jesus Christ, much less tell about his miraculous deeds. Instead, the fact is we all enjoy an amazing level of freedom when it comes to our faith, especially here in Cleveland, Tennessee. This past week, a group of pastors and ministry leaders serving in churches all over our county met with our mayor, Kevin Brooks, to pray over him. And we did so at his request. As I listened to him that morning share about how we could pray for him and his wife, it occurred to me how unique our circumstances are. To have a high-ranking government official sharing with us his personal prayer needs and then asking us to pray for him. Now, that doesn't happen in most places, uh, and it certainly wasn't happening here in Acts chapter 4. Looking back over our text from last week, Peter and John, if you remember, have been arrested, along with a man who's been begging at the temple gate, but who was now healed by Peter in the power of Jesus' name. They were arrested because they had, now listen, they had the audacity to proclaim that Christ had been raised from the dead, and that got the attention of the temple authorities. So they arrested him. They took him to the temple through, from the temple gate and they put them in a prison cell overnight. The next day, they were dragged into the court of the Sanhedrin, which is the supreme court of first century Israel. No charge was stated, only a question. By what power and by what name did you do this? In other words, we know something has happened we're not going to tell you we know, but you know we know. Now, how did you do what we know you did? If that clarifies it a little for you. Because it's obvious that something miraculous has happened. The dispute wasn't with what they'd done. It was how did they do it? And Peter answers them. He tells them that it was Jesus who did it. The very Jesus of Nazareth that they had killed but who has been raised from the dead. But then he drives the point even further. He tells them that the only way for anyone to be saved is through faith in his name. Now, don't miss the impact that this statement alone would have made on them. For these religious leaders, you have to understand, for these religious leaders, their entire structure, their economic structure, their political structure, their cultural structure, everything for them was built upon a foundation of belief that salvation was uniquely theirs, apart from all the other nations. And that it was obtained through strict adherence to the law of Moses, which had been given uniquely to them and was held in their possession. Peter's words are more than just a new way of thinking, more than a typical zealot's protest. It was a radical departure from everything they had that kept them in control. What he says to them literally strikes at the very foundation of their power. Not only did he expose their act of murder in condemning Jesus to be executed, but he's told them that their victim, the one that they had put to death, he's their only hope. Now, stop there for just a minute before we look at our text. That's not what they hauled them in for. They brought them in there to rebuke them, not for him to rebuke them. And now they've got a problem. What are they going to accuse them of? Because the number of people being convinced by them is growing. So let's look at our text. Acts chapter 4, beginning in verse 13. Peter's response, as we'll see, shows that he is in full and complete control. Not only is he undaunted by their display of power, he openly challenges them to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior, and the Sanhedrin is stunned. Verse 13. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and they perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished. Now, I want you to try and picture what that looked like. Try and get an image in your mind. You've got all these men seated in their splendid ecclesiastical robes. They've just left the green room. And they're all seated in this little high, big semicircle looking down upon these three common 
men. And they're listening as the question is asked, by what power or by what name did you do this? And Peter says, Jesus. You killed him. God raised him. And he's the only way for salvation. And you have to imagine their jaws dropped. And their eyes got wide. That wasn't in the script. That's not how this thing is supposed to play out. They've had these kind of people in here before. All they had to do was question them, spread some intimidation on it, and then they'd buckle, but not Peter. He's given his testimony, his bold confession. And now they have to figure out what to do with it because they're astonished, stunned by this act of boldness. You see, they knew Peter as the Yahoo fisherman from Galilee. They knew him as the guy with the big ego and the bigger temper. Certainly not as someone who would, could string sentences together so convincingly. And it goes on, verse 13, and when they recognized that they had been with Jesus. You see, their impression of Peter and John was the same impression they had with Jesus when they confronted him. They confronted Jesus, another commoner with amazing boldness and knowledge beyond anything they possess despite their excessive training and this guy looks and sounds just like him here they were standing in the nation's supreme court facing the nation's most wealthy most capable most distinguished most intellectual and most powerful men of all the people and the thing that pops into their minds is how much they that this guy looks like that Jesus guy they talked like Jesus talked they acted like Jesus acted they behaved like men who had been with Jesus and you have to imagine this must have been their worst nightmare because of all the memories of just a few weeks ago, all the things they did to conspire against the innocent man, the man who did nothing but good, and they conspired to condemn him. All those memories start coming back into their minds as they look at Peter and listen to him speak. And then they look at that third man standing there, the one who was unable to stand, much less walk, or leap, not even 24 hours ago, and he's standing right there. How do you look past him? How do you look past that man? Just, do you just act like he's not there? Do you just focus on that thing at hand? Do you just ignore that man standing there who's clearly been healed by Jesus? Verse 14, but seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing, look, they had nothing to say in opposition. Well, they thought this was a slam dunk. They thought they'd bring them in, intimidate them, harass them, send them on their way, never to be a problem again. But here's this lame man standing there with them. And he's still identifying himself as a healed man. Now he's standing as one of the people who led him to the Lord. You see, this man stood with them in the temple. He stood with them through the imprisonment. Now he's going to stand with them while they're on trial. He could have easily slipped away. He could have easily slipped into the crowd after he was healed, but he didn't. He wanted to be with the Jesus people. So there he is, standing with them. He didn't have to say a word. The silent, indisputable testimony of his transformed life says everything that needs to be said. Now the accused have spoken in bold confession and freedom while their accusers sit in stunned silence. So what do they do? What is this grand body of leaders, religious and political leaders alike? What do they do? They call a recess. Verse 15. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. Now, honestly, it would have been a normal procedure for them to dismiss the witnesses after hearing their testimony. That would have been normal procedure. What wasn't normal was the dilemma behind their decision. Do they punish them? Do they release them? 
Because you see, if they release them, the people will believe that a miracle came from Jesus, that dead man. If they punish them, the people are still going to believe, but they're going to rise up against their leaders. Because remember, this is no small band of believers any longer. As a result of the miracle and the preaching of Peter, the Christian church at this point has increased to about 5,000 men in Jerusalem, likely upwards around 20,000 men and women and children. So their only conclusion is we can't deny it. Something's happened here. We can't deny it. They know they have to let them go, but they have to control the spread of it. Verse 17. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in his name. In other words, everybody's talking about this miracle. We need to shut it down. Everybody knew this guy. Everyone knew that he was the beggar at the temple gate. They'd seen him lying there at the best location, begging as people entered the temple. They'd seen him there for years, his legs useless to him. Now, he's jumping around. And everyone is saying that Jesus did it. The very guy that they thought they'd silenced forever. The only thing they can come up with was to threaten him. To tell him never to speak the name of Jesus Christ again. Why? You have to ask yourself at this point, why didn't they just accept it? I mean, the, the, the facts are there, man. I mean, the, it's clear, it's evident. How it, It's indisputable. Why didn't they just, why didn't they just accept it? Why didn't they just admit that there was no other explanation other than a miraculous healing had taken place? Why not just leave it there? Instead, they press the issue. And they try to force their silence with a heavy hand. Verse 18. So they called them. And they charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Wouldn't you have loved to have been there to see their look on their faces when they said that? You probably could have heard a pin drop in the whole court. They thought they'd just threaten them They'd back down, that they'd be grateful that no further charges were being made. They'd just let off, they'd be glad that they were let off for a good, good deed done. Surely they'll just be glad to get off the hook, right? Surely they'll be glad they can return to their families with no criminal record. We'll just, we'll just let this one go, guys. Don't, don't ever talk about it again. But what does Peter do? Does he compromise? No, thank you. You see, it had only been a few weeks since Peter heard very clearly the commission given to him and others by Jesus. All authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. People say sometimes, oh, you just want to convert people. Yes, that's right. Oh, you don't, you don't really, you're not all out here working in North Carolina with disaster recovery just so you can help people. You just want to convert, you just want to proselytize. Yes, that's right. Because Jesus didn't command us to go do good deeds. He commanded us to go tell people about him. We do good deeds because that's the kind of people the Holy Spirit has sown into us to be. But the commandment upon us is to go. Tell people about Jesus. Disciple them. Teach them. Baptize them. That's what God has told us to do. And Peter knows that. And it's only been just a couple of weeks since he heard it straight from Jesus' mouth. You see, Peter knew that the court of the Sanhedrin held great power among men. But he also understood that the court of heaven was greater and the commission he carried from Jesus was far greater than any regulation or restriction from men. He would not, in fact, he could not keep from preaching Christ. You see, for Peter, it was for him as it was for the Old Testament prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah reached a point where he was realized that everybody hated him <laughs> because of the message he was preaching. And so he complained to God. 
He said, God, why do you keep telling me all this stuff? Stop telling me. I don't want to talk about it anymore. I don't want to tell people about the judgments. I don't want to tell people about the news from you. I don't want to tell people anymore. Stop talking to me. And Jeremiah says in 20 verse 9, If I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, there is in my heart, as it were, a burning fire. Shut up in my bones, and I'm weary with holding it in. In fact, I cannot. And that's Peter. There's no way he can stand silent. There's no way he can stop preaching and naming the Jesus Christ as the one who is alone our Savior. There's no way. Verse 21, and when they had further threatened them, they let them go finding no way to punish them because of the people, for all were praising God for what had happened. Notice what's missing in verse 21. And their hearts were softened, and they believed on Jesus and let them go. Do you see that in there? It's not there, is it? No, instead, they just dismissed the case. That's how they handled it. They just dismissed the case. No verdict. No acquittal. Just dismissal. Because they know they're beat. And they know that these men who have been with Jesus would rather obey God than they would desire to obey men. So they issue hollow threats and they dismiss them. But the battle for them isn't over. The effort to silence them isn't ended. They'll wait for another day, another opportunity, and it will come. The persecution will continue. It will escalate. Verse 22 closes the section. It's almost like an annotation to the text above. Verse 22, for the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. Now, clearly, Luke's point in telling us this is to explain why the people were so amazed at the healing. I mean, this man's 40 years old. And his point is to tell us why it warranted so much Praise from the masses. 40 years, this man had been lame since birth. That means God, now listen, that means God didn't just heal wounds. He recreated legs. Do you get the difference there? He, he didn't just fix what had been damaged. He gave it new, that which was not there before. I think that's Luke's point. But for just a minute, let's imagine beyond what Luke tells us. This is a no-no for preachers, incidentally, but let's do it anyway, shall we? Let's just imagine for just a minute beyond what Luke is telling us and why it is that he's telling us, and let's try to imagine something that may have occurred, all right? Though I admit it's beyond what the Bible reveals it. If this man was 40 years old, now I want you to think about this. If this man was 40 years old, and he's been lame since birth. It's likely, as we've said, that he's been lying at the temple asking for money all his life. Now, if you do the math, at least his adult life, let's say he's been lying at that temple begging for the past 25 years, okay? So for 25 years, this man has been, he's been, who's been lame since his birth, but for at least 25 years in his adult life, he's been every day laying at the temple gate asking for money to come in. Now consider this. We know that Mary and Joseph were obedient to follow the customs and laws of their faith. So we know that they would have visited the temple with Jesus on multiple occasions throughout the year, all of his life for the past 33 years. Now, is it possible, just think about it, is, just try to wrap your mind, is it possible that Jesus had encountered this man before? Perhaps many times on his visits to the temple, from the time that he was just a boy, even until just a few weeks ago at the last and final Passover. J.B. Phillips puts it this way, described it this way. He said, when Jesus was born, this man was a little lad of some seven years, hopelessly crippled, excluded from the fun and games of other boys and girls, unable 
to help at home, unable to even attend school unless someone should carry him. And when Jesus came to Jerusalem as a boy of 12, this man would have been 19, 20. Jesus, bright-eyed, eager, just entering his teenage years, this man leaving them woefully behind. He had no work, no hopes, no prospect before beyond begging. Had he already taken up his place at the gate beautiful? Had Jesus looked at him with eyes full of compassion during those days that he visited the temple precinct? Had he talked to him? Had he said to him, cheer up, one day you will be made well and whole. And in a moment, through the power of the name of Jesus, this man was healed. Isn't that good? So what do we do with our text this morning? Scripture instructs us throughout. Now hear me when I say this. I'm going to try to walk through this in the time we have. Scripture instructs us throughout that in all circumstances, now listen, we are to be law-abiding citizens, living in complete Submission to the laws of our government until that law clearly exceeds the written word of God. At that point, the higher authority of God's word must be honored and obeyed. Now, in light of that and from what we've seen in the scriptures today, let me try to break that down into three very practical applications. Number one, we are commanded in scripture to obey and submit to our leaders. This includes governing authorities regardless of our approval or disapproval of them. The Apostle Paul instructs us very clearly in Romans chapter 13 that we are to live in submission to the authority that is over us because it is divinely appointed. And as God's appointed servant, our government is there to serve our needs and to execute justice. Fallen as it may be, it is worthy of our respect and honor because God, who is sovereign over all things, all people, all nations, ordained it. Peter eventually wrote in his first epistle, be subject to the Lord's, for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor or who, as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, Honor the emperor. It's believed by most that he wrote these words on the eve of Nero's persecution of the Christians. As the Christian church was on the brink of its most devastating persecution, the Holy Spirit inspired Peter to write those words. Because no matter, who, now listen, no matter who sits in authority over us, we are commanded to honor their charge. Number two, there are certain and specific occasions when we must resist our governing authority by refusing to obey their commands. Notice that just as the men of the Sanhedrin acted, the wicked will try to suppress the work of God and his authority rather than submit to it, no matter how obvious it may be. There will be times when we must resist the decisions made by those in authority over us, but resistance is not insolence. Refusal is not incivility. Scripture never gives us the right to be unkind or nasty in any situation. And that includes the words we speak and the words we type. Our obligation is to remain steadfast, and it does not permit us to engage in defamation or slander, which only serves to bring shame and disgrace to the gospel. 
Now, that said, there will be, as I said, certain and specific occasions when resistance is necessary. We call it civil disobedience. And there are many opinions on what is acceptable. Some believe that a Christian should choose to disobey the government whenever they want to. And whenever they personally feel justified to do so. There is no biblical support for that position. None whatsoever. On the other side of the pendulum are those who believe that a person must always follow and obey. No matter what the command, no matter what the consequences. And that position also has no biblical support. In fact, it contradicts all of world history. One historian noted that during the Nuremberg trials, the attorneys for the Nazi war criminals attempted to use the defense that their clients were only following the direct orders of the government and therefore could not be held responsible for their actions. And one of the judges dismissed their argument with a simple question. But gentlemen, is there not a law above our laws? You see, the Bible only supports one position regarding civil disobedience. When a government commands evil such that it requires a Christian to act in a manner that is contrary to the clear teachings and requirements of God's word, the church must resist that authority. R.C. Sproul summarized it this way. He said, if any authority under heaven comes to the Christian and tells him or her that they may not pray or preach or worship or tithe, or do any of the things God commands, that Christian not only may disobey, but they must disobey. When Pharaoh commanded that all Jewish babies be killed, the Hebrew wives resisted. When the king of Jericho commanded that Israeli spies be turned over, Rahab resisted. When King Saul commanded the death of his son Jonathan, the people resisted. When the kings of Babylon and the Persians issued blasphemous decrees, Daniel and the other Hebrews resisted. We are always to obey those in authority over us unless that authority commands us to do something that God forbids or forbids us from doing something that God commands. Number three, the priority of our allegiance to Christ should be evident on all occasions, not just in adversity or when challenged. Just as Peter and John were recognized as having been with Jesus, there should be no surprise to others by the way we respond or by our loyalty to Christ. Our lives should reflect our bold confession, now listen, before we're obligated to defend it. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 12, if possible, as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Amen? Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we're thankful now to have read a very straightforward instruction from your word by the example of Peter and John. We're thankful, God, that we live in a nation that is founded on freedom. But this is dependent upon continuing generations of men who are themselves fallen. So our allegiance ultimately, God and always, is to you. Just as it was for Peter as he stood before this Sanhedrin. Help us, God, I pray, no matter what the future may hold for us whether we will live in prosperity or in want. Should our faith be supported with the freedoms we have been given or if it should be denied 
by the oppression of a ruling government or some other authority. Let us nevertheless always stand firm and faithful on the testimony that you've given us and be obedient entirely to your word as it's revealed in the scriptures. Let that be the final law over our lives. For from it comes all justice and mercy. Help us, Holy Spirit, to be this as we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask our deacons to go ahead and make their way to the back and uh, prepare to uh, come forward. God has given us, and as they do, let me share with you, God has given us a bold confession just like he had, like Peter held. And it's set apart from every religion that's created for men. Now, don't, don't let me lose your attention here. Stay with me, okay? The deacons, they'll find their way. You don't have to worry about them. They're good. We're going to get them back. We can, we, every, our confession is different from every other religion of man-made presence. Our confession says that God has given us a way to be saved from the recklessness of our lives, saving sinful human beings from death and reconciling us to himself. That's our confession. And that he's done this through the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. You see, what God has done for us, he's done for us out of his goodness and love. Salvation is entirely the work of God through Jesus Christ and it's offered to us by grace because we cannot, hear me, we cannot save ourselves. Unlike every other religion, we confess that there's nothing we can do to save ourselves. We cannot stand before God on personal merit. We will not be rewarded with paradise by the way we live our lives. We cannot achieve perfection on our own. Good deeds, taking ownership of our decisions, following the right path, those things do nothing to improve our spiritual condition. Obedience, hear me, obedience will not get us into heaven. Paul wrote, he saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. Listen, every other religion has us reaching to God. Only Christianity has God reaching to us. Our only hope is the mercy provided for us through what Christ has done for us on the cross. As I said in the beginning, in just a few minutes, we'll take the Lord's Supper, and those elements are very significant to us because they remind us first that Jesus suffered in perfection and that he endured not just death, not just beatings upon the cross, he endured a lifetime of perfection, denying ungodliness and sinful temptations. All his life was marked with suffering. And we take that bread to remember what he has done, which is that which we cannot. And we drink the cup to remind us that our hope is certain because his death paid the price. And he paid it in its entirety. And so our confession is that on the night that he was betrayed, he laid these things before us and he admonished us to remember. So as the deacons make their way forward, let's pray and ask the Lord to prepare our hearts. Thank you for listening to this resource provided by Westwood Baptist Church. While we are so glad you were able to listen, we encourage you not to allow this to take the place of you attending a local church. If you would like more info on Westwood, follow us on social media at Westwood Life or visit us online at westwoodlife.org.